I don't know about you, but I was intensely disappointed when I finally saw the specs of the new Apple Watch. Disappointed, but not that surprised, given the publicity there's been about what would be or what wouldn't be featured in the first iteration of the smartwatch that was destined to put wearables into the mainstream. The key elements missing in the Apple Watch's first iteration for me are blood pressure measurement and perhaps blood glucose. But top of them all, blood pressure measurement. Yes, I know that the Apple Watch does heart rate measurement. I know that it counts the steps and the activity. I know it works with the iPhone to gather more and more health data. But the key element that would have set the Apple Watch aside and begun a proper revolution in wearables was in fact blood pressure measurement and it didn't arrive. Even although up until three months before the launch the indications were it would be included. My interest in this device dates back 20-30 years before it was even mooted. In 1986 I set up a company called Personal Technology Applications PLC to make what I then called a life watch. I imagined the life watch would become a stylish item of fashion apparel, but as well as telling the time, it would actually measure our vital signs. Heart rate, of course, but blood pressure and blood glucose and in time, other elements of our health. But 1986 was, of course, far too early to even contemplate getting such a device onto the wrist, wrist and making it stylish. I was, as I sometimes am, far too far into the future for practical business purposes. But my interest stayed with me. And for 30 years now I've been watching as technology has approached the point when it can begin to make our bodies smart. Now there were several suggestions about why the Apple Watch has not included blood pressure measurement in its range of features. One suggestion is that Apple couldn't make their measurements accurate enough. After all, we're all very different. Some people have fat wrists, some people have thin wrists, old people have very, very tiny wrists sometimes, and of course some people have very hairy wrists. And as a result of that, it may be difficult to get a really accurate blood pressure reading from a wrist device. But I would argue that the aim of Apple's wristwatch, smartwatch, was not to be a medical device, but to be something that was indicative of health in the way that a fitness tracker counts steps but isn't completely accurate. And I actually think that the achievements of wrist-based blood pressure units are coming pretty close to the ones that we can buy in drugstores, in chemists, which essentially are wrist cuffs or upper arm cuffs. Now, for me, the slight inaccuracy is unimportant. Another suggestion about Apple's choice not to include any blood pressure function in the first iteration of the smartwatch is that the American Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, the Feds, actually suggested that Apple shouldn't do it. Now, it doesn't really take much leaning by a federal agency to stop a company doing something, because if they had gone ahead against such a wink and a nod, they'd have been in real trouble and the device would have had to be withdrawn. The FDA actually says it's taking a hands-off to all the smartwatches. It's taking a hands-off approach to Apple and others who are trying to produce health information. Perhaps that's true. But it's also true that the massive monolith 
of the American healthcare industry, the professionals, are not keen to see patients taking control of their health. Why should somebody wear a wrist device that tells them their blood pressure when they could be paying a doctor to get that information? There's no doubt that devices on the wrist will arrive that tell blood pressure, which actually talk about blood glucose level and so on, but we may have to wait a year or two more. Meantime, our dumb bodies remain dumb, and the step towards smart bodies is temporarily postponed.